Hi there, I'm Chris Marion, and you're listening to the Queen Bee Sessions, conversations with Wisconsin women in conservation. We're here to tell stories about all the good work being done by Wisconsin's women farmers and landowners to protect soil, water, and wildlife. We hope these stories will inspire and encourage you in your own efforts to nurture the land and yourself. And we invite you to get involved with our organization, Wisconsin Women in Conservation. We're a collaborative effort between four agricultural nonprofits and the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service. See our events at wewic.org, W-I-W-I-C.org. Today, it's my great pleasure to be talking to Harriet Bihar of Sweet Springs Farm outside of Gay's Mills. Welcome to the Queen Bee Sessions, Harriet. Hello. Harriet probably doesn't really need much introduction since in Wisconsin's ag circles, she's quite famous. She has published books and manuals and taught hundreds, actually probably thousands of people about sustainable ag through UW-Madison and other uh, agencies, including the use of cover crops, pollinator habitat, and prairie savanna restoration. She and her husband, have managed a 160 acre certified organic farm in the Driftless region since 1989, growing bedding plants, vegetables, herbs, and small grains, as well as small small scale commercial honey and eggs. Right, Harriet? What else you got going on out there? Yeah, so it's very fitting. A lot of my friends uh, tease me and call me the queen bee. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Well, that's a great name for you. <laughs> we have worked together in a number of contexts, Harriet. So I have a bunch of emails for you, <laughs> but most of them have organic somewhere in the name. You're basically the, the queen bee of organics. When and where did your organic ag journey start? Well, um, when I was a kid, I actually grew up in New York City. But my family went to the Catskill Mountains every summer, the day after school ended, and and we were up there the whole summer. And so when it came time for me to decide what I wanted to do, I really didn't want to live in a big city. And so in 1971, um, I checked out the University of Wisconsin, and it And at that time in Madison, I could actually ride my three speed bike and get out of town. (laughs) I can't do that anymore. But that has been uh, 50 years. So Um, it's much bigger now. But I just loved, you know, um, being there in Madison. But then um, I just was very drawn to being out in the country. And so I moved out to a farm near Lodi and went to the very first farmer's market in Madison in 1972. That's awesome. (laughs) 72 or 73, I can't remember. So that that kind of started the journey, but a lot of it was just really loving to be out in nature. It just was so healing and calming and exciting at the same time just seeing all the different birds and trying to learn all the different birds and learn all the different plants and, and all the healing aspects of the various plants. And so that just um, kind of started the journey. And of course, um, if you're looking to be healed or calmed, um, poisons don't really fit there. So it didn't it made a lot of sense to be headed the organic route, which, you know, in in the early 70s, basically, there was just like organic gardening and farming magazine from Rodale Press. And of course, I had a subscription and, 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 you know, did quite a bit of um, read a lot of their books and, and followed their tutelage there over time. Um, And then let's see, I actually was a, and I still am a weaver, and I went around to art fairs and made my living between selling weaving and selling bedding plants and vegetables. Um, And so that was, and I really love doing natural dyes. So when people come to my field day, I'll have some 
skeins of yarn and, and uh, the plants that I made the colors from. And that's another thing too, is like, you know, there'll be plants that you just don't think they have much use, but they usually make a nice color. Wow. <laughs> so, although I haven't found much use for thistle, but I'm still looking. <laughs> uh, not that I want to nurture thistle on my farm. I don't. Uh, and so um, at one point um, when Organic Valley started up, I, you know, became a grower with them and I, I volunteered, I guess I've always felt, you know, you know, to be helpful to other groups and people in the community. And so I, um, they sent around a piece of paper and they said, well, here's these various things we need volunteers to help with. And they said, you know, they had one, one job or activity, which was to go around to the various farms and, and help the, um, the person who was selling the produce understand how many cases of cabbage were going to be ready next week or in two weeks. So he could work on the market. And also I went around with my Rodale books and, and, you know, Dipel and, you know, organic pest control stuff and kelp you know, for people to use for foliar feed. I bottles of fish emulsion, you know, we kind of to help the farmers with their growing. But anyway, uh, I said, I would love to do that. I thought it'd be so interesting. And then they said, well, this is a job. This is not a volunteer thing. And it was on the list of all the volunteers. I was ready to volunteer. Um, so then I ended up, I had a job. <laughs> so I had a job that was like two to three days a week, driving around to the 30 or so vegetable growers and helping them and, you know, and then helping the, the seller of the produce understand what was coming up. And I had experience, you know, because I had been growing vegetables, so I could kind of guess how many cases would be coming. And, but then at one point he went on vacation and, and he said, well, can you, you know, we're going to need you to sell the produce. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> my eyes got real big and uh, and so I did so he went away and but then it, he wasn't actually having that much luck selling all the produce that we had of course when do you think he went away end of August so all the summer produce all the fall produce everything's coming on and of course I had been working I mean I knew everybody's kids names I knew all their dogs I knew, you know, I had been to all the farms at least three, four times during the season. I knew everybody and I just couldn't, I, I, I was like, I am going to sell this produce. And the first phone calls I made on Monday morning, I, I didn't sell anything. And I came home and I had a good cry. And then I got up in the morning and I said, nobody's going to say no to me today. And it didn't matter who it was. I would just find somebody new if they were saying no. And so I did. And I, and I changed the whole program around because we were just selling to wholesalers. And instead, I started selling direct to the retailers because we had a truck. And so we went down to Chicago and, we, and I found someone else who would take our stuff up to the Twin Cities. And I oversold in that week. Wow. It was a lot of stuff to sell, but, and I got a better price because I wasn't, I was skipping the middle person, mm -hmm. you know, and some, a lot of our stuff was getting sold out in Maryland and Virginia. And I, I don't know. I mean, here it was getting all, and of course we, you know, had pictures of the farmers and, and all that. And so um, then when he came back from his vacation, he didn't have a job anymore, <laughs> but he didn't really want it anyway. <laughs> he, he started selling the cheese. So I did the vegetables for a few years, and that was then a full-time job. Then forget about the art fairs and the weaving. I had to concentrate on selling vegetables. Right. And, uh, but then he eventually left, and I started selling the cheese. And so I didn't know anything about dairy farming. So I thought if I'm selling cheese, I got to learn about dairy farming. 
So I went around to all the farms and talked to, there was only eight of them at that point, and learned a lot about dairy farming. And then I would go to stores and go to um, wholesalers and I would just have all these pictures and I would talk about the family and, and just because people would say to me, organic cheese, isn't it just, don't all cows just eat grass? That I can't tell you how many people said that to me, almost verbatim the same thing. And I said, no, <laughs> cows don't just eat grass. And some cows don't ever see a blade of grass right. that's living live vegetation. You know, even back in the 70s, there were CAFOs and a lot of confinement. And of course, all our cows were out grazing and no antibiotics. And, and so I ended up working at Organic Valley um, from 1989 to almost the end of 1996. And really kind of, um, and so that, that's how I got very involved in the organic side. But I also saw, um, by visiting all those farms, you know, how in tune they were with their own ecosystems. Mm. And the more that they worked in concert with nature, the more profitable they were, the less stress, stressed out they were because um, they were stressed out <laughs> most of the time. Farmers are, I live a stressful life. But when they, you know, when the cows are out on grass, as long as there's some rain and the grass can grow, you know, they, it's not as much work to than if they're feeding them all the time. And then when you push the cow to make more milk, you know, they get more, they get mastitis and they have all these other health pro mm -hmm. problems. The farmers were not having the problems. And so I was then looking more, well, how do you, how does this ecosystem thing work? And then I learned about NRCS and, and at the same, when I left in 1996, I became a full-time inspector, organic inspector. And so I went to more farms <laughs> and learned more about how um, paying attention to the ecosystem services that you can get on your own farm. And every farm is site specific. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what works over here may not work over there. Um, and so really the farmers who are most in tune and not looking to, you know, grow corn on every square inch you know, who are interested in having back, you know, beneficial insect borders. We didn't talk so much pollinators, but we understood beneficial insects. Right. And, and we understood diversity, you know, having a diverse pasture makes those cows healthier. And, and, and even in the vegetable world, you know, companion planting and, and just all these different things. Um, and of course, I was experimenting all the time and still am on my own farm. Um, and it's so exciting when you learn something or even when you, when you learn that that didn't work, <laughs> it's like, well, why didn't that work? And, hmm, you know, it, it, it to me, um, that's one of the very exciting things about organic is always you learning something new and you can always do a little better. And of course, most of the time, it's just kind of leaving your mind and heart open to really mm. being able to see what's out there and, uh, and love the beauty of it too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So well, that was kind of my organic and conservation kind of went together. Yeah. Well, I didn't know that about you until recently that you had worked with Organic Valley. Of course, my interaction with you has largely been in the education world. You've been, an educator for about 40 years, right? How many farms do you think you've been on in the in in your career? Can could you even have a sense? I, yeah, I've tried once to add them up. About 2,500 to close maybe 3,000 in there. And then, but and I also visited a lot of processing facilities. So you know, you kind of you know understand, you know, what's the quality that they need and why do they need it? And you know. I mean, it's harder to make cheese from low quality milk. Yeah. Because trying to add, they add in their own bacteria, like, a, you know, like making yogurt. But if there's a lot of other bacteria, they don't, 
it, it's harder when they get a lesser of a yield from the milk. Mm -hmm. So that's why they're always pushing farmers to have bitter. But, and so it's the when, same with that. When you come out to someone's place as an organic inspector, um, you're bringing your own knowledge, but also tidbits and, and pieces of knowledge gleaned over 40 years of work on 25,000 farms. <laughs> 2,500. 2,500. 2, well, <laughs> I'll just brag about you. I don't, I don't, I don't. <laughs> well, can you tell well, us about. I always had to, yeah, I always had, to, you know, uh, very honest and honest with the farmers that, you know, that the people maybe don't always want to share what they have learned. Well, so I sure. learned it because I'm an inspector. So instead, I would, you know, I was very good at asking the question, have you ever thought about other cover crops? You know, mm -hmm. you know, I won't say, oh, you know, your neighbor is doing this really cool thing, you know, but I would just kind of stimulate them to think about yeah. trying new things by just asking the question and not, and of course I wasn't telling them, you know, they should try other cover crops. <laughs> Have you ever thought about it? Well, you, you know, and then, yeah, you've experimented with a lot of this stuff on your own farm. Um, sweet Springs. Can you tell us about your farm? Are there actually sweet Springs? <laughs> <laughs> there are actually the university uh, uh the, the beloit college had a class and and they came out here like i don't know five or six times during the summer with a class and they uh you know tested everything <laughs> from my springs um but yeah it's it's here in the driftless area so it means that out of the 160 acres really only about 40 of it is tillable the rest of it is woods and fairly steep, mm -hmm. um, but there's also beautiful and there's natural reproduction of brook trout in the in the stream, and it always has been. It's very clean and clear, and you know one of our so you know one of the things that we do for recreation we go out we walk the dog and the do the two dogs and and um, we like to walk along the creek and and now we know we're like they they kind of move around but we watch the trout. And, and I don't know, at this point, you know, we talked about, you know, fishing, but they like our pets. <laughs> and there's one that's really big. <laughs> Grandma's out there. And I'm like, I want, you know, and there's a lot of them that are in that, that, that fishing spot, that deep hole. But I'm like, I don't want to catch the big one. <laughs> I want her to keep, keep uh, going on there. Um, so I, you know, we have, we've worked with NRCS quite a bit because it's very steep here. So there was a lot of erosion, uh, control measures that we've done as well as things like we've put in frog ponds and, um, planted flowering shrubs for the wildlife. And we've, we really concentrated lately on, uh, well, lately the past about 12 years um, on pollinator and prairie habitat. And we do have um, about an acre that, that is like 12 or 14 years old. And it, I mean, just this year, we started noticing new plants. Wow. We, we keep noticing, so there's just more and more and more diversity. And basically about every five days, there's something new blooming out there. And we've already been through, I'm trying to think how many things have already bloomed. About four things have already bloomed. And now the fifth one is starting, that, which we have a lot of it out there, the prairie beard tongue. And it's just this sea of white flowers. And, and it just keeps going all season long. You know, we have the um, Leatris, the blazing star, compass plant, and rattlesnake master, and it just keeps coming. And of course, but it takes management. Um, and I did put, put that, uh, was all put in using organic methods, no herbicide used. There's no thistle, never has been <laughs> in that area. Um, and so, you know, I can help people understand how to, how to do that. 
if they don't uh, want to start out. I mean, a lot of the NRCS um, at that time, and now they know better. (laughs) They know it can be done because not just me, but other people have been able to put in prairies without relying on Roundup. But it, but back then in the, you know, early two, 2000s, you know, it was kind of like, if you want to put in a prairie, you got to use Roundup. And I said, Roundup's not coming here on this farm. <laughs> I know way too much about Roundup to want to use it. And so anyway, so then we, we did take um, our ridge land and we put it in uh, conservation reserve because we knew we weren't going to be using it. And so we've been working a lot on um, doing a 25 acre pasture, I mean, prairie. So the other one was just one acre. And so we've been doing, you know, prescribed burns and, and, um, and it's, it's worked out quite well. It's really um, doing, it's not as nice, but I mean, it's only been five years. So <laughs> all of those, so all of those different flowers that you mentioned that something new every five days, what kind of impact does that have on your honey? Oh, well, that one acre prairie is right in front of our beehives. <laughs> so oh. our honey tastes really good. <laughs> and, and we, um, but we also grow clovers. I mean, we do a lot. We always look about cover, at our cover crops with the eye of, uh, you know, what kind of nectar sources and pollen sources can we give our bees? Because it's better for them too, to have this, all this great diversity. It mm. makes them healthier. Um, and the honey tastes great. And uh, so we just, the crimson clover that we had planted last August just finished blooming. And if you've never seen crimson clover, um, I'll have some pictures of it at, the, at our field day, but uh, it's just gorgeous and it smells intoxicating. And it's this deep m- maroon, Uh-oh. I'm not gonna answer that. Um, we know you're a busy person. (laughs) Um, And um, what happens is the queen bee in the hive, what, because the crimson clover comes on very early. So it usually blooms around mid May this year. It was more around the 25th of May because everything was kind of behind but it stimulates the queen to lay a lot of eggs wow. because there's this tremendous source of nectar and pollen out there. So she feels like, then, of course, they don't know that it's going to all die out in two and a half weeks, but she then gets stimulated. So then when we do start getting more uh, other clovers and the prairie plants really start get going, then there's this huge uh, army of worker bees ready to go out and collect. And so it it helps our honey production to have that very early um, clover. What do we grow? We grow lots of different clovers. We grow buckwheat. We, we grow, yeah, we just, so we grow, you know, we always look to for um, cover crops that maybe give us more than one benefit. Mm -hmm. So, so like a clover is is a legume, so it's it's fixing nitrogen for us, but it's also blooming for the honeybees. And then we, I laugh and I like to say that we rotationally graze our bees because the clover will die. And so what we end up doing is, is mowing down strips. So pretty soon we'll probably mow, the, the white clover is just kind of coming to its peak We'll mow down a strip and there'll still be some, you know, white clover blooming, but that'll stimulate the next, the regrowth. And so then we'll get more bees. So then all the bees get pushed over <laughs> to the other white clover and then they'll move over, you know, so about every two weeks we mow a strip down our clover patches just to kind of always have some, some new blooms coming all season long. So your clover patches are perennial. Is that right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, some of them do die out and then we replant, you know, kind of rotate things around. And you're using. And we might, 
we might put vegetables there because, you know, mm -hmm. we got all that nitrogen. So we, we have a rotation between cover crops and, and vegetables and herbs. Okay. Okay. Wow. Well, I have a quote from you that I have seen in a number of places. I love it because it's similar to the WeWIC motto, which is nurturing land and ourselves. But your quote is, it is very satisfying to know that you are taking care of your environment since a healthy landscape is a beautiful and enriching place to call home. I just love that. Can you say a little bit more about that idea? First of all, what is a healthy landscape? Well, having diversity and basically, um, you know, encouraging that diversity and, and native plants. So there's, you know, a constant um, battle seems with invasives, but we try to kind of encourage the habitat for the natives so they can kind of take hold. And, and we, we look at it, you know, even, you know, we, we love our woods as, and we love our stream and we love, you know, we love the meadows and we love the fields and, um, and we kind of try to provide for all those different ecosystems. And, you know, of course, you know, like last night, the frogs were just amazing. And of course there's all the fireflies and, you know, it's just a, and if, and if we didn't have kind of the taller grasses, then we wouldn't have as many fireflies. Mm. And so we like to leave, you know, some of those areas so they can thrive too. Um, I don't want to scare people off from coming, but we have a lot of snakes here too. <laughs> <laughs> we have, you know, and so, but we have to kind of be careful because um, the electric fence, the, that, that mesh fence for the poultry, has kept the the uh, snakes out of there. Oh, that but makes when sense. We, yeah, because they, they we have big enough snakes they would like to eat our chickens. <laughs> oh my gosh! We don't have yeah, we have the large what they either call a chicken snake or a rat snake. Oh, you know, and they're wow. like, they're like six feet long, and they're kind of out there slithering around. Oh my gosh! We have corn snakes, garter snakes, and bull snakes, and. And I, you know, the one I, the other a couple of years ago, I was kind of down by the creek and just kind of sitting there and enjoying the little gurgling of the water. And, and, and then all of a sudden, this snake kind of came out from the tall grass and I didn't even see, and it swallowed a frog. Oh my gosh. I, got I saw it grab the frog and the, like the legs are hanging out and I'm like trying to get my phone out so I can take a picture. You know, you barely saw the ends of the, the feet. I didn't even notice the frog. That's amazing. Because it had blended in with everything. And of course, so I don't know what I was paying attention to, but all, but when I saw the movement, I was like, Whoa, <laughs> but that's nature. You know, I mean, the snake has to live too. Yeah. Well, and we I, provide I, a lot of frogs. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> a healthy. What? Yeah. What? Well, and we find too that, um, you know, having beneficial insects um, helps our vegetable production. Like, I mean, I can't remember the last time we used any kind of pesticide on out in the field. We, we just don't need it because yeah. there's all the you know, uh, parasitic wasps. And I mean, even like our broccoli, cauliflower, we don't get cabbage worms. I mean, knock on wood. I mean, who knows? But I, I mean, I, we just don't, we don't use any of it. And we noticed over time, the more diversity we had, the less reliance we had on outside inputs. Mm -hmm. Well, you talk more than most um I would say conservation educators uh, more than most about the profitability aspect. Um, I've, I've heard you present in a lot of settings and you often talk about the, the profitability of, of farming this way. And I think that's, um, I think that's really important and really significant. And it sounds like in a lot of ways, it comes from your background being on those farms with the organic Valley producers, always trying to help them get more, um, 
more more profit off their land while also nurturing the land, which is pretty amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, how what would you say to someone who has who who's sort of agnostic or skeptical about whether you can be committed to conservation and profit at the same time? Well, I mean, to me, why wouldn't you want to surround yourself with beauty if you could (laughs) and then still, you know, make enough money from the land to be able to keep it? Right. I mean, that's, you know, if you can't, you know, I mean, people lose their land because they can't make a living on it. And if you're if if it's if it's not something you need to make a living from. You, I mean, you still want to feel like the it's not draining you, right? Right. But you you can. Um, I mean, working with nature's tools. Uh, first of all, it's it's just so interesting how everything is. You know that web of life, everything interconnected, and uh, and when you the, the more you learn about that, it's just it's just so to me so interesting how you know the um, you know preventing erosion into the into the creek makes it so that my you know the brook trout can naturally reproduce and why it happens that way and um, and all these different I mean I just recently got a little pamphlet of all the native bees. I, 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 don't, I don't even know them. I mean, I, I'm, this is my goal this summer. I want to learn more of the, because I see them and I know they're different. I can tell these are different insects, but I don't know what, who they are. So I want to know who they are. <laughs> well, And then I feel like when I know them, I will have a better idea of why they're there and what they're doing. Yeah, well, this is what makes you such an amazing educator is you are endlessly curious. I mean, that is evident every time every time that you present. But if I had to pick one word to describe you, Harriet, it would probably be mentor. Um, you have mentored so many people that I know um, in prairie restoration and in organic agriculture. Um, and I, I just took some great pictures of you. You teased me when I was doing it, but I did get some good shots of you just chatting one-on-one with women at a, a recent field day we were at together. And you just have so much interest in communicating to others the, the wonder of this type of agriculture, this type of stewardship. Um, you are currently a conservation coach with WeWIC, Um And in that role, you're mentoring women who want to incorporate more conservation on their properties. But you've been doing this already for years and years and years. Why is it so satisfying to you to mentor other people? Well, first, it's it's very interesting to me to hear other people's goals. Mm -hmm. You know, I have my own viewpoint, but then, you know, I learn from the the people I am mentoring or even just discussing with is like, oh, I had, you know, they have their own idea of, you know, well, you know, my grandfather owned this land and this is what he did and I want to honor him or what, I mean, whatever it might be, um, you know, or, you know, when I was a little girl, you know, we, there was an owl's nest and, you know, and I just always wanted to, you know, make sure that there was a place for this wildlife. I mean, whatever was, was, um, motivating them yeah. to, to be interested in conservation. So that's the first. So then it's, it's kind of a challenge. So, okay, so how do we take this piece of land and, and, and get their, you know, what are their goals and how do we, you know, move down that path? Because again, we, it's, it's everybody that we're not looking for monocultures or cloning, you know, what I've done here, everybody should do. Everybody should do what they feel good doing and which is also respecting and honoring what they already have there or what could be brought back because so much of the ecosystems have been kind of, you know, ripped apart and anything we can do to kind of bring them back together, um, you know, it's, it's an honorable thing to do. And I think that's what, you know, a lot of, you know, that's the, the nurturing 
part. What what can I do? And like I've said, and you pointed out that you can do these things and still make some money. You know, I don't, you know, that depends, you know, how much money, I don't know, but, but it doesn't have to be just a, um, you know, a money suck for someone who has some land that, that they can get um, monetary benefit if they're trying to do some sort of agricultural production. And that actually in using the land, you know, having a high quality pasture for any kind of animal, chickens, pigs, pet cattle, you know, cows or beef cows, sheep, goats, I mean, all of the, you know, and, and then paying attention to what they need right. and what your land can produce because you shouldn't be overgrazing, you know, and you shouldn't be expecting cattle to really get much nutrition in the woods. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, so if you only have woods, that maybe uh, cattle is not a good idea for your <laughs> land. <laughs> Look about renting somebody else's pasture because it's, you know, you, you just need to be um, paying attention to what the enterprise needs and then also what your ecosystem can provide. Well, in I a healthy the- way, sustainable way. Yeah. I love you, the way you're articulating that you listen for what people's motivations are, also their goals, and then what their enterprise needs. Um, as part of your role with WeWIC, you're able to do free site visits with women landowners and farmers and write professional conservation plans for them um, through grants provided by WeWIC and NRCS. Can you tell us a little more about what a conservation plan is and why that would be valuable to somebody? Well, the the NRCS does some very detailed plans and mine would not be that. Mine would be more like a big picture, just a farm walkover, talking with the landowner, the woman who's involved and and seeing what her goals are and, and, and what opportunities are there. And then discuss, you know, oh, you know, you've got a stream here, you know, we can do some stream bank improvement or, you know, they'll notice how there's some erosion, uh, you know, when, when the, we have floods, you know, it eats away about at the side of the bank, you know, there's things that you can do and uh, NRCS does offer cost share on that, um, you know, or if they're interested in prairie or they're interested in Savannah or <laughs> what are they interested in, what do they want to do? Um, and so, my plan would kind of give them the various options of, of what kind of opportunities they have on their land and what kind of practices they could do if they want. And then also somewhat of a prioritization. Like mm-hmm. if you're going to do, you know, these six things, uh, this, is one, this is where you should start. And then, you know, two, three years later, when that's kind of, um, you know, implemented and doing well, then you move on to the next thing, you know, because it does help if you build upon what you've done before. Um, so that that would be what would be um, what I would provide. And then the other thing that the, the plans that I'm doing with WeWIC also offers a lot of information. So I wouldn't be like, I would just talk about uh, prairie restoration. I would, you know, give the landowner some pamphlets so they could, you know, they, they understand what the practices are and what we're trying to accomplish. And then they have time to, to read that and educate themselves. So this isn't being done to them. <laughs> <laughs> they are an absolutely integral part of what's going on and that they really understand um, what was being um, suggested for them. Well, that sounds amazing. I want you to do one for me on my place. So we'll have to talk about that offline. (laughs) But you will also be hosting a Wisconsin Women in Conservation Field Day at your place on July 15th. I think that's from one to five, something like that in the afternoon. What can participants who come expect to see and to learn at your field day? Well, the prairie will be in full bloom, I'm pretty sure, I'm hoping that the, all the butterfly weed, which is that orange milkweed, 
we've got a lot of that. I think that'll be blooming. And so whatever monarch butterflies are around, they'll be around. Um, and, you know, so we'll look at our prairie. We'll look where I, I'm not 100% sure how many different kinds of cover crops we're going to have, but there'll be at least six or seven um, different places where there's different cover crops being grown. Um, and then my the, the vegetable production and the I grow culinary and medicinal herbs and then I and I dry them. So I'll show people my my drying room, um, which is state licensed and uh, and the various herbs and how I do it. And it's pretty much um, and we'll also see my uh, earth bermed solar greenhouse which doesn't freeze in the winter, um, except when it gets like 10 below zero, then I have to make a wood fire. But <laughs> most of the time, if it's above zero, it, I don't worry about it. It does not freeze in there. So I have rosemary growing all winter. And, um, you know, so we'll look at the various, and, and actually our whole farm, it, we are on the grid. We're intertied with the grid, but we have, um, so, you know, we make all our own electricity and, um, I'm trying to think we have some frog ponds we'll look at. We'll look at the stream. Um, we'll look at some other NRCS um, work that was done to prevent erosion and prevent um, flooding in our fields. So there'll be plenty to look at. And then, like I said, I'll probably just have a table set up with some plants and some various yarn that shows the colors uh, from the from the plants. So I know, well, that's something, you know, a lot of women are very, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, and it's interesting. And, and like one of my favorites is uh, Queen Anne's lace. And it makes this beautiful butter yellow, just this beautiful, clear, clean yellow. There's no tinge of green to it or anything. It's just this beautiful yellow. You'd never guess. Is it the root it or root or the leaves? Oh, the what are you, plant. the whole plant? The whole plant. When it's, when it's blooming, I just, you know, cut down and I have, uh, you know, some big stainless steel pots and I just stuff it full of, make a very strong tea and, and then, you know, put in the yarn. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. I think that'll be fun. And then I grow some plants. So I have indigo and matter growing on the farm. Cause make, so I make blue dye and red dye. And, it, you know, there's so many gifts that nature gives us. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and they're yeah, and they're fun. It, you know, it's just always fun. And it's funny, um, on the very edge of our property, I don't even know if it was really one of the trees was, we noticed some cedar rust this spring. And, of course, that's bad for apple trees. But it, they, but it was it was probably at least a half a mile from our apple trees. But the first thing that is, it's, it's kind of this bright orange gall. It's it's about the size of like a a baseball, or just a little smaller, huh. and it's bright orange. Because the first thing I thought was, I wonder if I can make a dye from that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This horrible thing that everybody hates. <laughs> well, like, but then the next day, I, I, I went out and I said, well, let's collect some today. And because we were out walking the dogs and it was already gone. Oh, my gosh. Sometimes it had kind of desiccated and. Wow. So you just you know, so have to jump on it quicker than you think. Well, it's going to be so much fun to be at your place. I can't wait. Uh, I, I can't wait to um, see everything you have, all the things I've heard you talk about for years and years to get to see them. It's really going to be fun. And I'm really grateful to you for all of your generosity, just over decades with, with other farmers, um, with people from every walk of life and experience level, you have been incredibly generous. You, you are a gift <laughs> in the way that nature is a gift to you. You are a gift to the people who want to work with nature. And I, I appreciate you so much. And I can't I wait to see you. <laughs> well, I can't wait to see well, we're you. All, yeah, we're all in this together. It's, it's all, you know, we all learn from each other. We all support each other. 
and and it's uh, you know it's works it works i mean i gain every every time you know that i interact with someone and talk about farming or conservation or you know i always find it very um beneficial to to me that i i gain from it too even you know many times i'm trying to be helpful but i try to listen to and hear what they so i i guess would say you know bring you know people should bring questions and we we do use tractors and, you know, kind of tractor driven equipment, but we've also done things on a smaller scale um, also. So we, we have a little, you know, broadcast seeder and a little um, push, um, uh, what do you, uh, you know, something that presses the seed in, you know, so we've done, yeah, we've done small scale as well, but mostly we do with, with tractors. But well, I think we have about two and a half acres under cultivation. And that includes the cover crop. No, if it include all the cover crops, it's probably closer to five. Mm. Well, there should be something for everything and so, something for everyone. And I think it's really going to be, it's really going to be a blast. Hopefully we'll have a beautiful sunny day. Yeah, we'll see chickens and how we move our chickens around the farm, but I won't take people around the honeybees. Because I just, I don't know. Some people might be allergic. So, <laughs> But the bees will just be doing their own thing. They won't bother us. Well, and I think we'll have some kind of snack too. So there'll be lots of, it'll be fun and relaxing. We'll learn a ton. We'll get to network with you, but also each other. And I look forward to seeing you. Thank you for hanging out with us today. <laughs>